Well, guys, it's time to get back into our series that's a, been a little bit whopper jawed um, and moving back and forward. So let me recap, if for nobody else's sake, my own, uh, as we've been gone for, uh, I've been gone for the last couple of weeks. Uh, as we were looking at going to be more like Christ, as we're talking about more about discipleship, um, the, the thing that we're focusing on right now is the fact that Jesus is the answer. Does everybody agree with that statement, Jesus is the answer? And I think a lot of times when we talk about Jesus is the answer, we think about it from the standpoint of, well, of course he's the answer. He's the one that offers us grace. He's the one that offers us salvation um, by accepting Jesus again as a leader, forgiving our lives, by acknowledging with our mouth he's the Son of God, believing in our hearts he died and rose again. You're God, I'm not, and I follow you. Um, but I don't know if we necessarily think about it as much as the following you part, that that whatever I'm going through, whatever challenges I have, whatever decisions I have to make, Jesus is the, is the answer to that. Uh, and that, that's something we definitely want to be focusing on as we're talking about our discipleship and helping others to grow as well. And I'll be honest, I think um, that's one of the struggles that I deal with with the life that I have is that I truly believe that. And... Um, from that, I have noticed a notable difference in my life over the last 30, 40 years. Um, that's not me as much as it is just leaning into the fact that Jesus is the answer and leaning into his promises and believing those true or uh, looking at his principles and trying to live by them. Um, again, I'm far from perfect with it, but I am very thankful. Uh, Jenny, and, Jenny and I have movie conversations. Um, just read our wedding vows. The, um, took a second. One, two, three. Thank you, Monica. Um, but we were saying not too long ago that if either one of us was killed in a fiery car crash right now, it's, it's been good. Like it's been full. It, 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 what I, what I have, I don't take for granted with my wife and my children and the church and the ministry that we have. Uh, and I can, at this point at 55 can say, I sit here with a life that's good, that's um, a broad fill. It doesn't mean we don't have struggles, doesn't mean we don't have challenges or dead or whatever, but, it, but it's good because he is good. And being a pastoral care ministry or being in, uh, just a Christian, just like any of the, one of the rest of us, when you see people going through tough times and you, you see, holy, holy cow, the, the, the answers are in front of you, it's Jesus. Um, one, you can become quite annoying because they don't necessarily agree with that fact. Or, uh, or, or it's a well-meaning sentiment. Or it's, um, you know, it's heard, but doesn't, it, I'm glad it works for you. It doesn't really work for me. Um, I keep going back to the fact that Jesus is the answer in every way, shape, or form. And so when we look at this particular part of the series where we're looking at these spiritual disciplines, when we're looking at this, the, the spiritual... Oh, I forgot it's Christmas. We have to go to the next slide. There you go. Um, <laughs> that um, I, I pray that we're really leaning into it because it is practical. It is applicable to your life. It is something that you can take home a nugget of and make a difference in your life within a day. Uh, as we look at these things. So we, we've been going through, the original intent was to go through certain sp disciplines, certain spiritual areas of our lives uh, in the order that they really impact our spiritual life. Uh, the, the, again, you know how I am with surveys and that kind of stuff. Uh, you can make up, say whatever you want. But there was one particular survey that kind of caught my attention a couple years ago that these are the top indicators on whether or not we're leaning into Jesus being the answer. And the first one is whether or not we have a worshipful lifestyle. And the second one is what our personal devotion is to Christ. And you'll notice that because of my circumstances, I flipped those. I didn't say that they changed in order, but we did do personal devotion first. Uh, and then we did with uh, the help of video, good-looking GQ guy, uh, Jeff Bush from Mount Vernon Avenue Church Christ. Went through worship last week. We kind of hit it up again uh, with me on video. Uh, from eight years ago for, on uh, how to study the Bible. We, we really want to focus on those too. Now, I think probably, and again, I, I, like, I love getting feedback from you guys on what God's doing through these things. And probably the main feedback I got was a text in the middle of a, the sermon last week. 
Well, uh, as you can notice, it was from eight years ago. I have changed some. Uh, yeah, I used to be African American. No, the, uh, I was from Monica. I knew she would laugh at that. Uh, <laughs> but I, w I, was a I was a little bit larger. But um, the text I got from Katie Williams is, you're never allowed to shave your beard. And I don't know if that's a compliment. No, I'm not. Don't, don't try to side with my wife. It ain't going to happen. So anyways, but th those are what we had. The third one is what I want to dig into with you today, and that's generosity. According to this particular poll, um, and talking to people and looking at, uh, at how people are growing spiritually, generosity is a massive, massive factor just after worship of personal devotion. And um, by happenstance, it wasn't by happenstance, this one was completely planned. We did do a little generosity assessment. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yay. But now after your long, long wait, uh, I was down south. I do want to share with you a little bit of results as we're getting into the study on where you guys say we are today. Uh, we did have less response on this one. Uh, had 34 respondents, I believe, which was about 10 less than last time. Uh, so again, that agrees me because I want your input. But if you didn't do it, that's up to you. But I, I love having your input uh, the best that we can throughout uh, when we get input like this. Uh, but technically, not yet. Back to Christmas tree. There you go. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the the amount of people that did fill it out for the size church that we had is somewhat of an ac accurate presentation of where we're at on generosity. Let's go to the next slide. Sweet. Now I put a couple of tidbits there, um, and I know you can't overly see them, but it's just kind of more casual conversation. It's not the main point I want to get to, but like. The obligation to be clear, 76% uh, of those who took it said it's important for the, the church that, that, that uh, they are um, communicating what is going on with the, the tithes and offerings that are coming in. Um, I, I think personally, and again, this is why I start putting my own stuff to it, so this is not what the survey says, just me. I think it would be higher than that, but I think in our church environment, uh, some people are feeling that way because they feel like they can trust the leaders. Um, which thank you and I, I really hope that we work hard to earn that trust and to keep that trust uh, but we believe there's an obligation to be clear on how, how the finances are handled here at the church so uh, that's why you get the midweek uh, giving report that you haven't gotten the last two weeks while I was on the road um, that's why you get the quarterly report that's out there you get the quarterly giving reports uh, through your email you get um, Again, the elders get a monthly report of how all the spending's going into the different budgets. Uh, so it's accessible to everybody. And if you ever wanted to go deeper into it, we have an open book policy. If you ever say, I'd like to see what's going on with the finances, we sit down and go through the finances. The only thing that's not open to you is who gave what. That, that is not open to you. But besides that, we want to be clear. We think accountability is a big part of that. So I, I lo love that number. Uh, communication not landing, 11%, uh, which ends up being two people uh, report they're not comfortable with how the church talks about money. So two of the 34. Uh, again, the, set, the downside, and this is, this is why I'm not real nuts about uh, anonymous surveys. Uh, both people were anonymous, so I don't really know what their thought was behind that. I would assume usually a lot of times that's either we talk about money too much um, or they don't agree with tithing. That's usually what those two answers are. If it's something else in that, and you're here today or watching online, and you want to talk about it, feel free to touch base with me. But I will say, uh, we do talk about money. It's an important topic. I think time and money and resources are the three things that rob us from our spiritual life the most. Uh, some of you might have heard that uh, the number one topic that Jesus talked about on his time on earth was about finances, because of uh, just because how messed up they can be with us spiritually. Uh, I do want to correct that that is not true that is not the number one topic he talked about it was number 15 number one was his description of uh, the kingdom of God but out of all the things he talked about 15 is still pretty high I think it's 33 or 36 mentions that he talks about finances and in, in, uh, with, within the scripture it's a big part of life we do talk about it we do believe the tithing is biblical uh, Chuck did a great sermon on that within the last year wasn't it I'll tell you, you know, a year and a half ago, uh, go to our, our, our page on. Uh, it, it has great information on that. So if the concern is we talk about money too much or uh, that we talk about tithing, I'd love you. Let's go to Panera. Okay. 
Satisfaction with giving, uh, only 2%, which is one person out of the 34 said that they are extremely satisfied with their level of giving. So that's very low. Uh, 44% said they were interested in preaching or programming or the financial well-being, which I assume is not the two people above them. So, uh, so those are just some of the side notes. But the big thing I wanted to go to, if you would, Lisa, is it breaks out our giving types as a church family. So again, just so that we have a good feel for where we're starting as we go into this particular, uh, <coughs> this particular topic. There are three areas that they, t they talk about. We have... See, can you guys even really see them? The green one is generous, the yellow is developing, and blue is active. So let's start with developing. Uh, how they describe that is these donors report giving to their home church but few charities. They are less satisfied with their own level of giving. Their giving may be limited by their personal finances as they are more likely to report that debt is a problem in their lives. When asked how Christians should give, how much uh, Christians should give to their home church, developing givers Top two response, uh, responses are as much as they're willing to give or as much as they're able to give if you have any money left over after expenses. Because of the circumstances, developing givers might look for other ways to be generous. At times, they might choose to volunteer more at church rather than give financially. Developing givers can benefit from programs that teach financial wellness strategies and debt reduction, da, da, da. So that's, that's our yellow block. So about 30% there. Active givers, which is at the blue, uh, these donors report giving to some charities in addition to being more likely to give to their home church. They were somewhat satisfied with their own level of giving, and personal debt was more likely to be a nuisance than a problem. When asked how much Christians should give at their home church, active givers give two responses. Uh, the top two are as much as they're willing to give, or the tithe, 10% of their income. Even though they are actively giving, they have room to expand their generosity. Active givers can still benefit from resources that teach about generosity, financial wellness, and strategies for debt reduction. Okay, so that's our, that's our big group, 65. Now, just so we have an understanding, 65, that does not mean 65% of our church tithes. Uh, we, we tend to stay right about 38%, 32% is the national average, but that, but that they are active in giving and will be generous. Um, generous givers, our top 6% here, huh? These donors report giving to a wide range of local, national, and international charities, including their home church. They are satisfied with their own level of giving, and personal debt is not a problem in their lives. That'd be nice. When asked how much uh, Christians should give their home church, generous givers' top two responses are 10% uh, of their income, or enough that it is sacrificial. Gener generous givers were the most likely to say that true generosity is a discipline. Because of the circumstances that to its, to its giving, generous givers may be naturally positioned to mentor others in generosity, debt reduction, and financial wellness. So that's kind of where we're at. If, if you continue the averages, we're in the, the, the general ballpark. Does that make sense? All good? What do you do to you? Oh, Amanda looked like JT just jabbed in the side or something. Looked like he jumped. No? JT, just be nice. Okay. So with that, I do want to get into generosity since it's the number one big one, and I want to do that with actually with my favorite story of generosity in the scripture, uh, outside of Christmas. I mean, you really can't beat Christmas in the, in the gospel message. But I want to go to Ruth. If you guys would, we're going to turn to Ruth chapter 1, one of the heroes of our faith, uh, Old Testament-wise, uh, right after Judges. And um, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful story. I don't know if you've studied it in a while. There is a... Uh, again, if you go to the, the YouTube page and do a search for uh, Ruth, I did a, a deeper study on her uh, five, six years ago on the, the, the women of our faith, the heroes of our faith that uh, you might be interested in. But Ruth has got a story that I think, and not just story, a testimony, that I think really lays out what gen generosity should look like from a faith-based standpoint versus what the world teaches us to be. But again, this is not just about money. It's time, resources, and our finances. This is, this is what it should be. And it's not just nice about what it should be, but it's nice because it shows us if we follow the world's understanding of generosity, the difference that it makes versus following God's faith-based understanding of generosity. Does that make sense? We've got two characters in here that one chooses the worldly, one chooses the, the, the faith-based, the, the, the true understanding of what we have and why we're supposed to use it. And it's a dramatic, dramatic difference in our lives. Uh, and maybe a testimony that would help somebody if they're struggling with the fact that Jesus is 
truly the answer. So we're going to read a little, talk a little, and we'll get the whole story on the, on the t table. And uh, I'll be honest, I'm still debating what things I'm going to say and not say, so we're just going to uh, pray over this before we start, and then we'll get into it. Dearly Father, thank you for your, uh, your heart that is overwhelmingly generous. Your love, your provision, your patience, your truth. Father, everywhere we look in the scripture, beginning to end, everywhere we look in our lives as we lean into you from beginning to end, we see a generous God. And since you made us in your image, teach us, challenge us, empower us as we look at this testimony of truth from our sister. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so now chapter 1, it says this. There we go. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judea went to sojourn into the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Eli, sure, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Stevie and Bobby. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Eli, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with the two sons. These two took on Moabite wives, wives, so not people of God, Gentile wives. And the name of one was Oprah, and, and the other one was named Ruth. They lived there for about ten years, and both Stevie and Bobby died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So there's a great famine in the land of God, he takes things into his hands. They go to another country. They go into a country that's not of God. His boys get married, and then all the men die, and now they're left desolate. They're just complete poverty. Um, so in this place, so we have the, the cast of characters. Naomi is the mother-in-law, and then we have uh, Opa, and we have Ruth, the two daughters-in-law that are no longer tied to her because of the deaths of the sons. The only way that they can be redeemed into the family of God, since they have adopted God as their religion, is to marry particular men within that extended family. And so the, right now, that it's just not looking very good for them because there is no other sons to be, be looking to. Verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-laws to return from the country to, of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had, give, uh, had visited his people, and giving them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughter-in-laws, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. Again, the famine is now over. Happy birthday, Allie. And so now they have the, uh, now they have the opportunity to go back. She wants to go home. But, verse 8, Naomi says to the two daughter-in-laws, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that each of you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and she lifted up their voices, and they wept. And they said to her, both of them said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi persisted and said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet any sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should uh, say I have hope, even if I should have a husband but this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait until they're grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept, and Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Naomi is thinking just of the girls. You have no future with me. No, no way of being redeemed. I have no money. I have nothing. I'm going back penniless. Go back to your homes. Find a future there. This is worldly wisdom. It makes 100% sense, does it not? 100% sense. They, they, they resist once. She keeps on going. No, you have to go. Go out. So Oprah kissed her mother-in-law. That means she left. And Ruth clung to her. So she is going to stay with her even though she has no prospect of a life in any way, shape, or form. This is sacrificial generosity. 
That's the difference between the two. The worldly mindset versus the sacrificial generosity. Fifteen. And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people, to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. She tries another time. But Ruth says, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she dropped the topic. She said absolutely nothing else. Extreme. This is what you do for a family member that you love. It's not what you do for a neighbor. Not from a worldly perspective. It's not what you do for someone that you used to work with and you found, they helped, found you know, fell on hard times. I say prayer requests for them, but then I just, not from a worldly standard. This is the difference of two women who love their mother-in-law who one sacrificially gave. Going up to chapter uh, 2, verse 1, we see as the, the testament continues that Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a wealthy man of the clan of Eli, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, and uh, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go out, my daughter. She set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come along the part of the field which uh, belonged to Boaz, who was the clan of Eli. A couple of things I want to make sure you get in this. What she is doing is not something that you would ever want your kids to ever have to do. This is a sign of extreme poverty. She's going out, following the farmers around, <coughs> who are gleaning the grain, and picking up anything that they thought was either unworthy of eating or happened to slip out of their bag off of the ground. She's digging through the door. Maybe, maybe, every once in a while, they'll miss a grain. And that's the good stuff right there. But she is going out and taking the, the worst. Of, this, this is comparable to the, the prodigal son eating the slop of the pigs. Okay? Not only is that part of the situation, it's also an unbelievably dangerous thing to be doing. Because, and we'll come back to this, happened to come across the part of the field that belonged to Boaz. But to her, she did not know who owned this field. And most of the time, these beggars would be treated horribly as far as uh, the physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, verbal abuse, because they were begging as they went along. In this case, we're going to find that she asked permission to do it. But nonetheless, this is not something that they really wanted on their farms. That on top of that, if you're a young woman doing it, the likelihood of being raped is extremely high from the workers that work there. This is not this is not easy gig that she's leaning into. This is not a, a normal, normal thing going along. But then you get that part where she happened to come along the part of, of the field belonging to Boaz. Anybody believe that that was an accident? No. No. What was this? This is God moving her. The, the, this is the very first sign that we get that things are starting to shift because of her generosity that the God is starting to step in. Verse 4, Behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young uh, man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is a young Moabite woman who came from, uh, back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from now uh, from early morning until now, except for a short rest. A couple of things I want you to take note of. First off, see how he greeted his workers. Boaz is a, a, a godly man. He's a godly man. Uh, their response back is not like, what? Where did this come from? Th this is a Christian business. So that worked out her way as far as how, some of the threats that she had above her. He notices her. He asks about her. And what does he find out about her? One, that she's with Naomi. And we're going to see that that's huge in a second. And secondly, she's a hard worker. She's been here all day. She took one short break, and then, then she was, was right back to it. Uh, when you look at fourth, uh, uh, let's say, like eight through nine, uh, we're going to see how Boaz responds to her. Um, he tells her to stay in his fields. He wants to protect her. 
He tells her um, that she's going to be okay, and he charges his young men not to harm her in any way, shape, or form. Uh, if she's thirsty, he tells her that she has permission to drink from the staff water. She is uh, allowed to glean, and he tells them to leave, leave sheets uh, for her. So you know how he said every once in a while they might miss one? He's saying leave sections. Leave sections for her. I want her to have the good stuff. And he told them not to, not to rebuke her. When she finds out about all this in verse 10, it says that she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you used to take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Here's the answer. I love this answer. Boaz answered her, Because of everything that you have done for your mother-in-law, since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and your mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before, the Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I found favor in the eyes. Uh, I'm sorry, I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. We go back to Naomi over in verse 19 of chapter 2. Her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? Where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name who I worked with today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May the, he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. The one thing that was impossible. He's one of our redeemers. So she marries Boaz. She's redeemed in the eyes of the Lord. Ruth said that the, the, Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with the young woman, lest in another field will you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young woman of Boaz, glee, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat and harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Now, as you could probably guess, everything else is a Hallmark movie. Okay, <laughs> everything else ends perfectly. Matter of fact, I think you could probably find this on Hallmark if you want to audition, that they do get married. She is redeemed. She does have a vision. She does have wealth, and she does become part of the lineage of King David. And she becomes part of the lineage of Jesus Christ, who is the answer to all. Here's the thing that I find somewhat interesting in this, and I've not, I did not know this before. Um, I have always wondered, like, why don't we ever hear anything about Oprah again? Like, she never comes up in the Bible again. Like, there's a lot about Ruth, and Ruth goes really, really well, but I'd like to know what happens on the other side. Uh, there's nothing scriptural, but there is some in church history that is probable, but not definite. So I want to make sure everybody's on the same page on that. The, the two things that we have for her is, uh, one, she was never redeemed. She is called a name uh, within church history that means threshing. Now, you remember, Ruth found her redemption at the threshing floor by threshing. That's not what they're saying with Oprah. Oprah admit that she threshed back and forth from man to man that she never found her redemption. She, that the worldly life of trying to play the safe route did not work out too well. The other uh, the interesting tidbit that we have, and it's, I don't know, if, like I said, and it's probable but not definite, is the only other reference we have is she was best friends with a lady who was the ancestor to Goliath. Well, Oprah was the great-grandmother of David. Isn't that crazy? How the, the world and Christ wars against each other and who's supposed to win and how sen senseless it makes to us how that winning happens. Let me share a couple of scriptures with you. Um, I don't think I have them up on the screen, but I'll, I'll say them twice. I'm not sure. Mark 4.24 reasons why Ruth was raised up. Jesus says to them, pay attention to what you hear. Pay attention to what measure you use. It will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. 
this is not a health and wealth church. I'm not saying if you give a little money into the offering plate, then all of a sudden you're going to have some kind of cool car and I'm going to get the helicopter God wants me to have so I can do the ministry, get to Orlando and back easier. That's not the way the scripture works. But when we follow him, he provides. It's a broad place because he's pleased with us. And we stop bringing in the muck and the mire on top of it. And more would be added to you. Acts 20, 35, it says, In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of Lord Jesus, how he himself said it is better to, to uh, give, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Something we hear often about this time of year, but I don't know. Every one of us has experienced that, haven't we? Where it's better, you're more blessed when you give than receive? And 2% of us are happy with our generosity. Psalm 37, 25, I have been young and now I'm old. That's the scripture, not me. <laughs> I've been young and now I'm old, but I agree with this. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. Anybody want to debate that one? I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor have I ever seen his children begging for bread. We'll put this up. Uh, Oswald Chambers has a quote that I thought was pretty interesting. And hopefully you understand the concept of manna and the story of Moses. If not, talk to me afterwards. This is a very powerful point. If you hold a thing for yourself, it will turn into spiritual dry rot as the manna did when it was hoarded. God would never let you hold a spiritual thing for yourself. By the way, a spiritual thing in this context, resources, time, finances. He would not let you hold on to a spiritual thing for yourself. It has been given back. It, it has to be given back to him that he may make it a blessing to be to others. If you would turn with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 9. I think this particular section has some incredible, incredible truths for our note takers if you want some bullet points today of ways that we can start moving today in some new areas in this third area that impacts our spiritual life so deeply. As Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and we all, I think, know that the Corinthians were pretty jacked up. They had all kinds of issues going on all the time. But the letters are beautiful. And in verse 6, Paul says to them, the point is this. And you know he's got something good to say if he's starting out, but the point is this. This is what I want you to get. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it's written, He has distributed freely, He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Did you get that whole phrase? You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous in every way, which through that will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing in many thanksgiving to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. Why they long for you and pray for you because of the, the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. If you're a bullet point first, and the first one I would suggest to you is this, joyfully give to God first. Verses 6 and 7 cover this extremely well. Joyfully give to God first. If you think I'm making it up because I'm doing some kind of drive, remember we did offering already, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, and secondly, you can double check the scriptures yourself. The common comments that I get, um, first off, it's 
interesting that we almost always take this to tithing before we're talking about time, resources, and finances. So usually the things I get, it's going to be on the area of tithing. There's going to be uh, comments like, Jesus never told us to tithe, so I don't have to. Uh, if you want, I would encourage you to write down Luke 11:42. Um, he did not focus a lot on tithing as much as the finances end of things and the overall un understanding, but there is a confirmation of tithing in that. Um, others would take and say that, again, it's Old Testament law, and so Jesus fulfilled that, so once he resurrected, again, I point you back to Chuck's great sermon that he did about a year, year and a half ago, talking about how tithing was in place long before the law. Um, it's not impacted by that. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of things we kind of have to, to watch within this. I think another thing that we do is we kind of pick and choose. I was even kind of cautious on that on how I read to you some of the things on the survey um, because another thing that we tend to do, and I did for a while, is if I don't really, I can't really afford to tithe comfortably, so I serve. You know, I, I, I do my tithe and my, my time, uh, which, again, I have a huge heart for. Uh, that's the way I was raised. Uh, we, again, did not have a lot of money raising up, and this was a huge concern from my mom that she uh, didn't feel that she was able to tithe. And she talked to the pastor of our, our church, and um, I've shared this with you before, but, and he told her, well, Nancy, Nancy you, you, you do so much. You do so much. You help with the youth group, you help with this. That God, God sees that as your tithe. Uh, I, I appreciate his heart. He lied. He's wrong. It's just biblically, I, I'm to give my resources, my time, and my finances. Um, and I, I put him first, and uh, he's, never, he's never let me down on that. Um, but I do understand just how in-depth that, that challenge can be. Uh, I've had people look at this scripture here and say, well, he says you have to be a cheerful giver. Verse 7, right? God loves a cheerful giver. I can't be a cheerful giver if he's telling me what I have to give. Uh, that's a hard issue. The Bible tells me to take communion. It tells me to pray. It tells me to tell other people about Jesus. It tells me not to smack people when I'm frustrated with them. I can do those things cheerfully even though you told me to do it. Can I not? I've not quite understood that. I've heard people say that they distrust the leadership or they distrust God, and sometimes they just don't want to do it. I appreciate the last one because at least it's honest. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're ever in a place that uh, you're in a church that you don't feel you can trust the leadership with finances, by God, work on that because how can you trust them with your, your soul, your discipleship? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's a much, much bigger issue to be able to, to work through. Um, I wrote down a couple quotes in my, my studies. Uh, Sacrificial giving is a test of our trust in the Lord as our only source of money and provision, and it demonstrates our faith. That one, that one knocked me around a little bit. Sacrificial giving is a test of our trust in the Lord as our only source of money and provision, and it demonstrates our faith. Uh, the other one that... that I wrote down was deciding to be a generous giver is primarily a matter of perspective, not circumstances. Y'all got that? I saw y'all writing it down because that's good. Uh, that's good stuff right there. That could be on next t-shirt. Deciding to be a generous giver is primarily a matter of perspective. Second one stands out, verses 8 through 10, is this. Everything belongs to and is given by God. Everything belongs to and is given by God. Again, a lot of people, I, I, I will call for my money. Well, I know who you're going to fall on your knees in front of as soon as you get fired from that job. I, I, it's really, it's a matter of perspective. Um, I, I, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. God's sovereignty. James 1.17. I'll tell you, write that one down. That's a good one. James 1.17. Every good and every perfect gift is from where? Above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation, there whom, in whom there is no shadow due to change. There is no shadow due to his change. We are giving these things to manage for a return. In other words, I'm responsible for the things that he entrusts to me. Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put in your lap. I think Luth, maybe Ruth wrote this one. I'm... No, I guess it would have been Luke. For with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Remember that next time you skip helping somebody. 
when the Spirit's putting something on your heart. And to follow that Spirit equals faith. As you get better and better at saying, okay, I feel the Spirit's calling me to be part of this, and you don't go into, but how does that impact? Then you're starting to live by faith. Faith is the obedience that God meets with his power to provide and sustain. Faith is obedience that God meets with his power to provide and sustain. I can put these out later if you want them. Number three, we are given to, we are given to for the purpose of giving, 11 and 12. Go back, double check that, make sure I'm not trusting scripture on you. We are given to for the purpose of giving, so that we are enriched in every way, so that we can be generous in every way. Yes, that comes back to the tithes and the offerings. That comes back to how you treat your family and your spouse and for those who are dependent upon you. That comes down to how you tip a waiter and waitress when you know that you can tell that they're going through a tough time. That can come back down to, I'll tell you one of my favorite things to do. Uh, it's a little bit harder to do now because Subway doesn't have hot chocolate. But when you see people, do, oh, let's all do this just to really freak them out all just today. Uh, Salvation Army workers, when it's cold outside, give them hot chocolate, they're thrilled. Yeah, let's all do that today. We'll make one guy have to pee all night. <laughs> um, another one we did, maybe we came across by accident, is we bought uh, hand warmers for Emily's show choir one year, and we didn't need them anywhere near as much as we thought we would. Uh, so we, when we start going through drive throughs you know how the people are like freezing as they hand you stuff. Mm -hmm. We start giving out hand warmers. It's, it's generosity. Tell me, that, uh, tell me someone didn't go home and talk about that. It's so little. It's so little what God would do. Um, you can cover a shift for somebody at work. Everybody loves that one. Um, I was very much encouraged by a young lady who's, uh, I don't know well, she's a friend of a friend, and she's uh, going through rehabilitation uh, uh, for an alcohol addiction and some other issues she's going through. But she very badly wanted to volunteer at the Thanksgiving event this year. And I got to sit and talk to her for a while. Uh, she has so little, but her heart was so huge. She was willing to use whatever God has. We're given to so that we are giving. And a lot of us become so much more consumeristic than what we're meant to be. Now, before our generosity glorifies God, that's verses 13 and 14. If you remember, I kind of read that one a couple times over because I love that verse. So tithing puts God first. Generosity keeps him there. Does that make sense? Tithing puts God first. Generosity keeps him there. And then others receive your submission. Others receive your submission. I, where was that again? I just love that verse. Am I in the wrong place? 12, 14? The simple fact... Oh, it's 11, actually. You'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way because what's produced is thanksgiving to God. Our generosity glorifies Him. Okay, I wrote down a couple of notes and then I'm going to leave you alone. If you want a life like Ruth, because I do believe that worldly wisdom leads us into a lot more open situations than we want to admit. If you want life like Ruth, you need the gospel. If you've not accepted Jesus as leader forgiven in your life, you need it. He's the answer. It takes submission, insane submission to God. You have to be willing to be generous with a little bit or a lot. You have to bring thanksgiving to his name. You have to be willing to impact the lives of others. And you have to be strong when they walk away from it. And you have to receive his provision, time, resources, finances. You have to receive them with purpose instead of just survival skills. Second Corinthians 9.15 says, Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift inexpressible gift my original plan I was to share this message with you last week um, 
and to tie it in with the pink joy candle. <laughs> but I think this is still true today. You've heard this analogy of going ties. Lisa, you can go ahead and put, to put it up. That joy stands for Jesus, others, yourself. You've had to afford that a billion times. That's every VBS lesson, every, you know, whatever. I think if we can capture that in our lives, in our generosity, take a moment and imagine what your life would look like. What change would just happen? And I experiment with this, and I live by it now. And I'm sure some people find it annoying. I'm okay with that. If when you walk into a store, especially during Christmas and everybody's tired, I was talking to a lady at Duke last night. She works at the Dollar Tree store. She said she just wanted to go out and jump off of a cliff. It's just so crazy over there. You walk into the Dollar Tree store and you say hi to the people at the cash registers. You say hi to the people at Pasha. I'll let you know right now the the ratio in Marion is about 40% will say something back to you. It doesn't matter what they say. And you're joyful, and you help somebody pick up something that they, they dropped, and you see somebody struggling to pay the bill, so you jump in and you pay for their $5 worth of stuff at the Dollar Tree store or whatever. Just that little bit instead of, I got to get home and start cooking dinner. What generosity would do to your life. And in those beautiful real moments when you can point it to Jesus, it's astounding.